Fortunately the Milk by Neil Gaiman, illustrated by Scotty Young. Page 26. I needed no more encouragement this, than this, and I grabbed the rope ladder with both hands. Fortunately, the milk was pushed deep into the pocket of my coat. The pirates hurled insults at me and even discharged pi pistols, but neither insults nor pistol shots found their target, and I soon made it to the top of the rope ladder. I'd never been in the basket of a hot air balloon before. It was very peaceful up there. The person in the balloon basket asked, or said, I hope you don't mind me helping, but it looked like you were having problems down there. I said, you're a stegosaurus. I am an inventor, he said. I have invented the thing that we are traveling in, which I call Professor Stegg's floaty ball person carrier. I call it a balloon, I said. Professor Stegg's floaty ball person carrier is the original name, he said, and right now we are 150 million years in the future. Actually, I said, we are about 300 years in the past. Do you like hairy, hard, hairy, wet, white crunchers, he asked. Coconuts, I guessed. I named them first, said Professor Stegg. He picked up a coconut from a basket and ate it, shell and all just as you or I might crunch toast. He showed me his time machine. He was very proud of it. It was a large cord cardboard box with several pebbles on it and stones stuck to the inside. There was also a large red button. It looked like it looked at the stones. I looked at the stones. Hang on, I said, those are diamonds and sapphires and rubies. Actually said, I call them Special shiny clear stones, special shiny blue stones, and, um, special shiny red stones, I suggested. Indeed, he said. I called them that when I was inventing my really good moves around in time machine, 150 million years ago. Well, I told him, it was very lucky for me that you turned up when you did and rescued me. I am slightly lost in space and time right now, and I need to get home in order to make sure my children get milk for their breakfast. I showed it to him. This is the milk, although I expect that 150 million years ago you called it wet white drinky stuff. Dinosaurs are reptiles, sir, said Professor Stegg. We do not go in for milk. Do you go in for breakfast cereal? I asked. Of course, he said, dinosaurs love breakfast cereal, especially the kind with nuts in it. What do you have on your cereal, I asked. Orange juice, mostly, or we eat it dry. But I shall point this, I shall put this in my book. In the distant future, small mammals put milk on their breakfast cereal. I shall write a wonderful book when I return to the present. Actually, I said, I think this is definitely the past. It has pirates in it. It's the future, he said. All the dinosaurs have gone off into the stars, leaving the world to mammals. I wondered where you all went, I said. The stars, he told me. That is where we have all gone. So I said, can you take me home? Well, he said, yes and no. What does that mean? Yes, I would love you to, to take you home. Nothing would make me happier. No, I cannot take you home. In all honesty, I do not believe that I can take me home. The time machine is being temperamental. I need a special shiny greeny stone. I have pressed that button many times, but nothing happened. Button? Do you, don't, don't you mean big red flat pressy thing, I said? I most certainly do not. It is a button. I named it after my aunt button. Can I press it? If you wish, I pressed the button. The sun shot around the sky, and the sky started to flicker in nights and in days. The balloon began to rock and lurch and zoom around in an angry fly. I held on to the rope as hard as I could. Fortunately, I, held, I was still keeping tight hold of the milk in my right hand. When we stopped being blown all across the sky, it was night, and according to Professor Stegg, we had only gone back about a thousand years. The moon was nearly full. I'm either farther from my children and our breakfast, I said. 
You have your milk, he said. Where there is milk, there is hope. Ah, over there. That looks like a perfect landing platform for time-traveling scientists and floaty ball person carriers. We landed on the platform and got out. The platform stuck up out of the jungle and had flaming torches on each side. There were people standing on it with very black hair and sharp stone knives. Is this a balloon landing platform? I asked the people. It is not, said the fat man. It's our temple. We are very. We had a very bad harvest last year, and we had just asked the gods to send us a sacrifice to make sure that this year's harvest is better. When you floated down in that thing with your monster. Thank you, by the way, said a little thin man. I was going to be the sacrifice if no one else turned up. Much obliged. So now we will sacrifice you and your monster. But my children are waiting for their breakfast, I said. Look, I held up the milk. Why did they all just fall to their knees? Asked Professor Stegg. Is this usual hairless mammal behavior? Perhaps, perhaps I should hold up on some hard, hard, perhaps I should hold up some hard, hairy, wet, white crunchers and see what happens. Coconuts, I told him. They are called coconuts. What is that you were holding? The fat man asked. Milk, I said. Milk, they exclaimed, and they prostrated themselves on the ground. We have a prophecy, said the fat man, that when a man and a spiny-backed monster descend from the skies on a round floaty thing, floaty ball person carrier, said the, the little thin man. Yes, one of those. We were told that when that happened, if the man held up milk, then we were not to sacrifice them, but we were meant to take them to the volcano and give them as a present the green jewel that is the eye of Splod. Splod? He is the god of people with short, funny names. It is, I said, a remarkably specific sort of prophecy. When did you receive it? Last Wednesday, said the fat man proudly, the priest of Splod was woken in the night by a voice whispering from the heavens. And when he went to look and see who it was, there was nobody there. Also, he was sleeping on top of the temple and nobody else could have been up there with him. So it must have been either Splod himself talking or one of his angelic messengers. We walked together down a jungle path. Professor Stegg carried the rope in his mouth that led up to the balloon, and he dragged the balloon along. After half an hour, we reached the volcano. It was not a very big volcano. There were wisps of smoke coming from the top of it. On the side of the volcano, there was a carving of a big, scary face with one eye in the middle of its forehead. The eye was the biggest emerald I had ever seen. A shiny, a special shiny green stone, said Professor Stegg with his mouth full of rope. The fat man clambered up to the side of the volcano. It is a good thing that Splod himself told us to give you the eye of Splod, said the little thin man who had narrowly avoided being sacrificed. Because there is another prophecy that if the eye of Splod is ever removed... Great Splod will awaken and spread burning destruction across the land. Here you go, said the fat man. He handed us the emerald. Professor Stegg nipped up the rope ladder into the balloon's gondola and began to install the emerald in the time machine. Hang on. He was a stegosaurus. Yes? Then how could he just nip up a rope ladder? He was, said my father, a large Stegosaurus, but very light on his feet. There are fat people who are excellent dancers. Are there any ponies in this? asked my sister. I thought there would be ponies by now. I was standing on the ground, holding on to the rope ladder, when the ground shook and the very small volcano began to belch smoke and lava. Splod is angry, shouted the little thin man. He wants his eye back. There was a rushing wind and the balloon jerked me up into the air, high above the spurting lava. Unfortunately, I dropped the milk. It wasn't holding onto it tightly enough. It landed on top of Splod's head. 
Professor Stegg hauled the rope ladder up with his tail. I've lost the milk, I told him. That's not good, he admitted, but I know where it is. It's on top of Splod's head on the side of the volcano. Professor Stegg said, great, good Splod. What on earth is that? Before our eyes, another balloon, just like ours, appeared over by the volcano. A man hurried down the rope ladder. He placed a large emerald in Splod's eye, picked up the milk from Splod's head, ran up the ladder, and the balloon vanished. A very small volcano stopped erupting as suddenly as if it had been turned off. It was a bit peculiar, peculiar, wasn't it? said the professor. It was, I agreed, gloom and despair and despondency overcoming me. That man in the balloon stole my milk. We are lost in the past with jungles and pirates and volcanoes. Now I will never get home. My children will never have breakfast. We are doomed to float forever through a dusty air of the past in a hot air balloon. It is not a balloon, said Professor Stagg. It is a floaty ball person carrier. What nonsense do you talk? Now I think that should do the trick. He finished attaching the emerald to the box, using string mostly, and also sticky tape, and he pushed the red button. Where are we going, I asked. It seemed like the sun was zooming across the sky as if nights were following days in a flickering strobe. The far, far future, said Professor Stegg. The machine stopped. We were hanging in the air above a grassy plain with a very small gray mountain beneath us. There, said Professor Stegg, it is now an extinct volcano, but look. On the side of the extinct volcano was carved the face of Splod, still recognizable, even though it was much eroded by time and the weather. And in the single eye was a huge green emerald, a perfect twin to the one that we attached to the time machine. Right, said Professor Stagg. Grab me the special shiny green stone. I went over to the side of the gondola and down the rope ladder. I pulled the emerald out of the eye socket. <laughs>